It, it has a weird honeycomb head that shoots out crystal spores and giant pincers for arms and some pretty butterfly wings. So I guess that's what's valued in Coruscant society. And we have to go off of that. And my assumption is that does not mean that they treat all of their Coruscant crawlers as friends and lovers. <laughs> yeah, I'm with Jared. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, I, I think we all agree on that. <laughs> but I appreciate you trying. <laughs> it, it really is like, if you have two spike arms... It could go either way as far as morality is concerned. When you have like six spike they have arms. so many. <laughs> they have spike legs. It's all spikes. I don't it's... think these things could walk. <laughs> Welcome to Monsters and Multiclass, your Dungeons and Dragons fix. I'm Kevin Odie. I'm Jared Bornigal. And I'm Will Melden. And we'll be hanging out with you for a while to talk about anything and everything D&D related. On this episode, we are taking a look at the core spawn from the Explorer's Guide to Wild Hunt. So let's dive into it. So, as I literally just said, the correspond from Explorer's Guide to Wild Hunt. Let's dive into it. <laughs> just get loop. That's the whole what are, we, what are we talking about today? The correspond the from the Explorer's, the Explorer's Guide, Guide to, to Wild Hunt. Let's dive into it. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the uh, correspond from Explorer's Guide to Wild Hunt. Oh my god, don't say it again. <laughs> just... This is like when you challenged me to not begin uh, the episodes with so, and I was like trying to fight against it. And it's like, how do I, how do I begin talking without doing that? So that's yeah, not yeah, my there, challenge for It wasn't for so, you. there was something you always said. I don't remember what though. It was, it was just like that style thing, like, well, or so, or something right, before yeah. talking. <laughs> Feels wrong to just start talking. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Let's talk about the course, fun. <laughs> from Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount. <laughs> These are aberrations. Um, so Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount, Wild Mount being the critical role world, and it has its own book and a lot of deep lore. We're not going to dive into a ton of that. We're, we're not intimately familiar and these are really great monsters to kind of pull out and put in any setting if you're not playing in wild mount the the lore as written just to kind of quickly quickly cover it is these came as like they are the herald servants foot soldiers and lieutenants of the elder evils awakened in the depths of the cladis clad cataclysmic there we go i'm not redoing that actions of the betrayer gods and their minions um they're usually deep underground kind of core of the earth could be really great things like if you're playing in any like uh sword coast favor that sort of stuff where you have um the underdark put them in there um anything like that they're, they're pretty much just evil they're all they're chaotic evil aberrations with their own nefarious plots and ideas there's four of them they're yeah. just kind of neat to throw in together change up to fit your lore right and when i have used it i used one of these uh in the past I saw there was a whole bunch of lore and ignored it entirely, and you can too. I think what a good way to do that is to put them in in chaotic regions. Uh, anytime there is a, in, in the same way that like slods uh, were like born of chaos, I think that mm -hmm. exact same lore kind of fits here, where you can just say, oh, this is a chaotic area, and there's a lot of chaotic negative energy around here and because of that it created one of these core spawns so very very flavor uh light way of of throwing these in right um another kind of realm agnostic thing like the first sentence the elder evils assault the multiverse in strange and calamitous ways i know the elder evils are specific to wild mount wild mount is my understanding but it does talk about the multiverse so that's something this is kind of big greater abstract threat that's out there and whatever plane you are on they've breached into it a bit and then the correspond come about um yeah it's usually they're yeah, in desolate lands, yeah, chaotic areas. Some will go to research them and often come back as like shells of themselves based on the nightmarish things they've seen. So a lot of ways you kind of rope into your party trying to figure out what's going on here and you need to go stop them, things like that. So the first one, the most numerous, is the Corspond Crawler. Yeah, they rarely travel alone. They're usually in big groups. They're agile predators. Like I said, it's kind of like the cannon fodder of these things. So they're still definitely not... 
not that not that weak. The our challenge rating one, armor class of twelve with hit points of twenty one and a speed of thirty feet. Uh, the higher stat is Dex at fourteen. Lowest is Charisma at six and shortly followed by Strength at seven. So nothing too crazy. Uh, perception plus five in the skills. They are immune to psychic damage and immune to being blinded, and they actually have blind sense, blind sight out to thirty feet. They are fully blind beyond that radius, though they have tremor sense out to sixty feet. Yeah, which low confusion on the wording, but yeah, I'm not sure where uh, blind sight would be helpful, but tremor sense wouldn't be. Oh, well, I guess tre- tremor sense you have to be on the ground. So if you're flying, yes. okay, you're not like just immune to to them or to being seen by them just because you're flying. Right. Well, if you're beyond 30 feet, you are. But True. Yeah. Yeah, they understand deep speech but can't speak. Uh, they have pack tactics, which is a common type of type of thing for these. Um, like you see with like kobolds and I think wolves have them and stuff. Yeah. They have advantage on attack rolls against a creature. That when, if there's at least one of the crawlers allies within five feet of the creature and the ally is inca- incapacitated. So pack tactics can get very scary and very out of hand. And seeing as how these are kind of the numerous travel and big groups, pack tactics is pretty perfect for them. Where they get real scary for a challenge rating one is they have a, a multi-attack and they make four attacks. Yeah, that's a lot is for challenge nuts. rating one. Yeah. And there's multiple of them. It's not like this is the only thing you're going to be fighting. Right. So it's one with its bite, two of its claws, and one with its tail. So it's bite attack. It's a plus four to hit, reach of five feet. Um, if it hits, it's 1d4 plus 2 piercing damage, and the target must succeed on a DC 11 wisdom save or become frightened until the start of the crawler's next turn. Okay, that's then, pretty strong just right out the gate for, again, challenge right. rating 1. Adding the frightened ch- condition is pretty painful. Yeah. Yep. That it has its two claw attacks, each one plus four to hit, reach a 15 feet, 1d4 plus two slashing damage, and then its tail attack plus four to hit, another reach of 15 feet, and 1d6 plus two piercing damage. That's a lot of damage. That's a lot of range. Yeah, that's yeah. the bigger part, I feel like. They're small creatures, too. I did double back on that. Like, medium, maybe. That just seems like a lot. Yeah, this is like a dog with a 15 foot tail. <laughs> like, for, for some scale there. Yeah. I don't think most dogs have, have that kind of reach. If you're 15 feet away, yeah. they, they have to just get to you. Right. <laughs> now, pack tactics only comes into play when there's another one within five feet. But what this really means right. is that you can have a uh, like layers deep. So if, if you've got, like let's say, just the worst case scenario, right? You have one player character and they are surrounded by these creatures like literally one in each square you can make another string of them 10 feet out and then another one 15 feet out and they can all still attack this one person so if you want to have like the this would be a good enemy to use when you have aoe's that you want to see them get used and be awesome because they are dangerous if you let them crowd. Very, mm-hmm. very dangerous. Because that's a lot of pack tactics. A lot of rolls at advantage. It's going to be a lot of bookkeeping as well. Because you're just... It's a lot of rolling. A lot of numbers. Whatever. But uh, once the wizard throws a fireball down, it's also going to be really fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they only have 21 hit points. Yeah, so that's just So nothing too gone. crazy. Yeah. They're gone. Plus two on a deck save. Um, and then oh, yeah. it's, do you even mention the tail yet? I don't know if I, I might. Yeah, I did. Yeah, okay. reach 15 feet plus four to hit, 1d6 plus two piercing. Yeah. So definitely, I mean, probably not like something you want to throw by itself at your party unless they are pretty low level. But I think for these other corresponds, and I actually kind of wish I did this now in retrospect, is great minions to throw on when you already have a correspond. That's kind of the, the main focus. Yeah. Yeah, these are great minions, great add-ons, great like initial encounter if you're like entering the area where there's these correspond and the first thing is you fight ten of these. Yeah. And let's say you're challenged, right? You're you're like a level ten party. Right. You it's know, not gonna be hard. Still be, but very, it's still a little bit of a challenge. It's a light resource drain, which is yeah. good. Right. You know what I think was a missed opportunity here? Adding not having a climb speed. Oh yeah. That's fair. They've got these like hook arms, which, by the way, the art is 
fantastic. Yeah, they will be up on the screen when we discuss these if you're on YouTube. And if you're on the podcast, you're shit out of luck. You'll have to imagine <laughs> them. Uh, but they're like kind of bug-like. They have these like spikes on their weird wormy tails. And as mentioned, the, the hook hands. So yeah, the inability to climb or have a climb speed does seem like a bit of a, a missed opportunity. Yeah, they're yeah they're also called crawlers, and just with their low challenge rating and the the flavor of they're always in large groups, I picture them just kind of like pouring out like over a wall, and right? Like skittering down it and swarming around and that sort of stuff. Right, like Kruthix. Kruthix? I forget how, what those are called, but they're like basically little bug monsters. All right. Um, that they kind of have, kind of like ants. Yeah. Yeah, they look a lot like these. To be honest, uh, they're they're not as strong, but. Either way, those have, I'm pretty sure they have a climb speed. Those burrow specifically, though. These right. do not. Yeah. So, yeah, good cannon fodder enemies. Good start to the course pod. Throw in just counters of just a large amount of them. So, introduce things, minions later on. Good, solid, consistent use. Next up, we get the course pod emissary. Uh, I get serious collector vibes from these from Mass Effect 2. Oh, based on the yeah. Art. Yeah. So these airborne predators serve as assassins and sentinels for the correspond. The terrible thrum of its insectoid wings and its shittering of mandibles announces an emissary's arrival. Uh, they expel clouds of crystalline spores from tubes in its head. That, that's all in here. We'll just get I, to the stat box. I love how you're saying that, though, as if it's so, like, you know, oh, whatever. They just expel clouds of crystalline spores Well, as from I started tubes reading, I realized, like, well, we're just going to cover that when we go through the stat block because these are, it's all accounted for in the stat block. Yeah, okay. That's but what I meant by that. Like, don't don't say it's <laughs> so blasé. That's... <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's my style. <laughs> All right, challenge rating six, so we're jumping up a lot here. Um, armor class of 15, 102 hit points, fly, speed of 40, and a fly speed of 60. And they have hover, so they could stay still and not be like full if they are prone or anything like that. Uh, strength of 17. Yeah, it's really good stats all around for the most part. Strength of 17, 15 dex, 18 con, 8 wisdom, 8 intelligence, 13 wisdom, 8 charisma. Saving throws a plus 5 to dex, plus 4 to wisdom, and plus 2 to charisma. Another just skill of perception of plus 4. Nothing crazy there. Also immune to psychic damage, immune to being blinded, and a blindsided term since out to. 30 and 60 feet respectively and i think they all have that so i'm just going to stop specifically calling that out um same language as two understands deep speech but cannot speak but doesn't have telepathy out to 120 feet these yeah, guys have so that's mi- different hmm? i see so that's different they, the they can yeah i assume that means they can communicate with people then right uh these guys have magic resistance they have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects which is always great to see uh, then they have a multi attack, so they make three talons attacks. Their talons are nothing special, though they do hit pretty hard. Uh, plus six, six to hit, reach of five feet, and if it hits, it's two d ten plus three. So if all three six, we're looking at six d ten plus nine damage. Yeah, that's that's good. up there. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. In addition to their talons with their multi attack, they have another action, alluring the thrum. This is a recharge on a five or six. So after you use it, you roll a d6. If you get a five or six, it comes back. And you do that every round until it comes back. The emissary emits a dreadful yet alluring hum. Each creature within 20 feet of the emissary that can hear it and that isn't an aberration must succeed on a DC 14 con save or be charmed for one minute. And you can repeat at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on a success. Okay. I I have a hard time with these types of abilities because the, the recharge of five or six seems a little bit odd. If you spend all of your time trying to use this, then, I don't know, the creature's not really doing anything. It's just charming the, the party. I don't see a way of using this out of combat, really, because I don't uh, know. Yeah, like, I don't really see, yeah, like conversing with these things and them trying to like trick you or you trying to negotiate with them right they're they're chaotic not evil entities i mean they're just right so when i literally see stuff the like that, minions of the evil gods right or whatever they call them so so when i see Elder that i'm evils. always just kind of on the on the fence about whether or not it's 
it's worthwhile. Like it feels like it's it's in there, but should you really bother using it? Probably not because a DC 14 constitution save isn't really that high. It's not like you're just taking you know, multiple people, people out of the combat. You might get one person, but realistically you're just kind of losing an entire turn. Right. And in combat, the charmed condition really the only effect is, is that like, if you're charmed by this thing, you can't specifically attack it. Right. Or like I target it with anything harmful. Which I mean, you're is not like uh, pretty good. I don't know if you charm the should, barbarian. Then it just attacks other things. It's not. It's not dominate. It's not. The barbarian is not on your side. Right. They just can't attack the emissary. Correct. I guess I was viewing this as more of like it probably would be only one enemy compared to the uh, crawlers where you'd be fighting twenty of them. But that said, you could very easily have multiple emissaries for one, but also you could have an emissary and the crawlers. And then right. just as you said, the barbarian goes and destroys all of those and has fun with that. Yeah. It, it feel like the, the, it needs something where you are charmed and then well charmed in this way. I, I don't know if making it more like a dominate person would be too strong, but it seems I mean, fitting based on the kind of flavor of this. Yeah, it does seem fitting. It's definitely too strong because that's a, a level five ability that it'd be able to do it on multiple creatures. Um, if they did right. go that route, it would need to change from each creature within 20 feet and it should just be a single creature. Right. Or make it where if you fail it, you cannot attack any correspond. Like you sure, see the correspond sure. as friends are no longer a threat. Yeah. Not, not so much where you would then attack your friends, but you, you would remove yourself from the fight. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. And you could do that in the similar manner to uh, what they said is like anything that you are charmed by all aberrations. Yep. And bam. Sure. Yeah. All right. And then their final ability, Crystal Spores, recharge six. A 15 foot radius cloud of toxic crystalline spores extends out from the emissary. The spores spread around corners. Each creature in the area must succeed on a DC 14 con save or become poisoned. While poisoned in this way, the creature takes 2d10 poison damage at the start of each of its turn, and they can repeat the same throw at the end and in the effects. So that's pretty great. Poison condition sucks to have it. So if you are poisoned, you have a disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. And then in addition to this, you take 2d10 toys and damage at the start of every one of your turns. And you can repeat the save at the end of your turn. So you're guaranteed to at least take some damage if you fail the initial one. Right. Now, I believe, does Lesser Restoration cure poisoned? It does. Yeah. So it's not terribly hard to clear the condition but that's still in a best case scenario if you fail uh using the action of somebody else to get rid of that for you right and a spell slot and a spell slot yeah so that's great i don't think there's enough of the poisoned condition i feel like it doesn't really come up that often and when it does it doesn't usually do damage over time as well like you might just get poison and that's it this is actually one of the first times i feel crazy saying this maybe i'm i'm way off base but i feel like this is one of the first times i've seen you're poisoned and while you're poisoned you take 2d10 or just damage every single turn that's not really common um, or it that? totally is it's, it feels like it should be right but every time right. i remember like finding something that poisons i feel like i see it and go oh okay it's just the poison condition it doesn't do any additional damage um I don't know. Hey. As far as damage over time is concerned, no, you're correct. And that's why this is actually kind of weird. This is... As statistics play out how they are, and this is not a DC that's impossible, but there's no reason this would ever go away if you were sufficiently unlucky. Oh, you're right. I guess it doesn't ever end until you succeed a saving throw. It's not even like or for a die. minute or anything. Right. Or you're cured of it, obviously. Or die. Does dying I technically poison? doesn't end it? No, yeah. I guess it doesn't. No, <laughs> Get, I mean, getting if, brought back and dying immediately because you still can't pass a fourteen DC con. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> it's a thing, and you it can, can happen. Yeah, and you need to cure the person of the poison when they're alive. Usually, like you can't. Once a creature dies, they become an object which is like a weird fifth edition thing. Uh, sure. But once they're an object, a lot of the spells that say you target a creature no longer work. And yeah, it makes it so you can't, 
use lesser restoration on a dead body, <laughs> which makes sense when you say that. But <laughs> I guess, but it yeah. sucks when you think of oh, okay, I'm going to use revivify. All right, you're back up, and oh, it's their turn. Two d ten, still poisoned. <laughs> It's like uh, it's like a really just weird version of mummy rot. Yeah, mm-hmm. nowhere near as debilitating, but yeah. I, I think this is actually this could be with sufficiently bad luck, an absolute player or a party killer. You're not wrong because the amount of damage that it does is, as mentioned, absurd. Um, and in theory, if you use the crystal spores and you poisoned somebody and then you charmed them. They wouldn't attack this creature, and I don't think that damage being done would can would break the charm. Now I need to look does, up charmed. Is I say I don't think that's written into it at all. Of charm, nowhere does it say like if you damage the thing you have charmed, it ends. Yeah, yes. you're right. Spells you're right. that call that out. You're right. This one, this charmed. You're right. Does not have any type Which of. Which is it can't a little attack. weird, but yeah. Right. So, but. Still, that could be a good way just to like start damaging somebody and not even focus on them. And you're just like, yeah, go enjoy being poisoned for a little bit. I'll deal with you when I can get to you. Right. Uh, interesting to por- point out the crystal spores. It doesn't say anything is immune to it. It doesn't say like if if you're like the alluring thrum. If you're an aberration, you you automatically succeed. Oh, where's crystal the crystal spores, spores hit down? everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the other correspondent are not immune to poison, so they can absolutely hit their allies with us. I don't think this thing cares. Yeah, I was going to say, though, I don't think it cares. It's just like, oh, no, we killed 20 of the correspond crawlers. My bad. Let's keep going. <laughs> There's a thousand more behind them. Right. To which I was about to counter signal that I believe that these creatures are probably extremely empathetic and have a flat societal hierarchy and value each one of their friends. I'm sure. Like a lover. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I actually, that's the problem is like you look at these things that look like, you know, dead space bug monsters. Right. And there's just not a lot of flavor. So you just kind of paste it on there. It's like these are just soulless killing machines. I mean, yeah. If you if you use the concept of you evolve in what your society values, um, it it has a weird honeycomb head that shoots out crystal spores and giant pincers for arms and some pretty butterfly wings. So I guess that's what's valued in correspond society. And we have to go off of that. And my assumption is that does not mean that they treat all of their correspond crawlers as friends and lovers. (laughs) Yeah, I'm with Jared. (laughs) Yeah, no, I know. I I think we all agree on that. (laughs) But I appreciate you trying. (laughs) It, It really is like, if you have two spike arms... It could go either way as far as morality is concerned. When you have like six spike they have arms. so many. <laughs> they have spike legs. It's all spikes. I don't it's... think these things could walk. <laughs> I think they're permanently in the air. Well, no, the way that their legs are bent, it makes it oh, seem like Oh, you they... could just kind of. Yeah, they're yeah, like little like hook on ones. I feel like that's like a a robot somewhere, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so I have to assume that they they can walk on them at least, but... I figured they'd be slow, but they still have that speed of 40 feet, so they're not that slow. Uh, yeah. um, I, I don't know. This thing would be terrifying as hell to see running at you, though. Yes. Do you think when it runs, it would still flutter its wings? Probably. Yeah, that's Maybe that's why it gets the extra 10 feet of movement. <laughs> that's, that's how it works. Yeah. All right, next one. Correspond Seer. These are humanoid arcanists corrupted by eldritch power of the elder evils through blasphemous rites of accursed or accursed encounters, ravaged by otherworldly radiation and disease. The bodies are covered in horrible protrusions of fluorescent crystals, which emit a psychedelic glow from beneath the tattered folds of their robes. Wow, that's really so, cool. I wish that yeah. all diseases could be that awesome. <laughs> like oh yeah you're so then, diseased you've got so many diseases oh yeah how's it look oh you got some cool glowy crystals and like grow extra legs like their lower half is like the almost kind of looks like a lizard with like 
like a six legged lizard. Yeah, that part I don't. They got like these as little tan, like T Rex tail and things. I'll I'll take just just the crystals, please. There's okay. a lot going on anatomically with this. Yeah, this there is. <gasps> yeah. No more face, just glowy rocks. <laughs> Anyways, these are challenge rating 13, AC of 17, 153 hit points, and just a speed of 30 feet. Strength of 14, dex of 12, constitution of 18, intelligence of 22, so big jump up there, wisdom of 19, and charisma of 6. I think the other ones are, yeah, 9 and 8, respectively, of intelligence. Yeah, they were not. Well, uh, the emissary's intelligence is so low. I guess. I mean, it's its whole thing is that it's just like, it's the messenger, right? But not in like a let's talk yeah, this out way. It's I guess like that's a, true. The messenger of doom. <laughs> that's true. All right. Uh, these guys, the seers, have a saving throw of plus six for dex, plus 11 to intelligence, plus nine to wisdom, and plus eight to charisma. So some very high saves starting to go on there. Perception of plus nine. Um, conditions and all that is the same. Actually, oh, no. no. It's not. Condition immunities of charmed and frightened. It's not immune to being blinded, but it still has blind sense out to 60 feet and tremor sense out to 60 feet as well. So I think it's blind sight went up to 60 yeah. instead of 30. This guy does speak common, deep speech, under common, and has telepathy. Uh, a passive feature of Earth Glide, the seer can traverse through non-magical, unworked earth and stone. While doing so, the seer doesn't disturb the material it moves through. So like uh, Earth Elementals, get this, same sort of thing. I have a feeling it's just kind of playing into the crystals that are on its body. I think so. Otherwise, the flavor doesn't give much to go off of, of why they could do this. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the crystals thing. Sure. And it also has magic resistance advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical uh, effects. Uh, so combined with its high save... Pretty great. It would be probably hard to get off like the the saver suck spells on this guy. And this guy, and I think these definitely do kind of position themselves more as like a boss encounter. Yeah, without a doubt. Type thing. Yeah. So in actions, it has a multi attack. This year uses its fission staff twice, psychedelic orb twice, or each once. So its fission staff is a melee weapon attack, plus eight to hit, reach of five feet. Um, it does 1d6 plus 6 bludgeoning damage plus 4d8 rating damage, and the target is knocked prone. So that's neat. That hits hard. Yeah. It's good, good a little start. goofy to picture because it's like the squat little thing with its like awkward legs and all of that. And it looks like it should just be a caster. But so it can sort of see like scurrying up to you and just like a big thunk on the top of your head and a flash of light and it just knocks you prone and hits you a lot harder than you think. That is so much more comical than I have it in in my head. Like this thing I, is is terrifying to me. It just looks goofy to me. Like it's like too much. <laughs> it it actually, you know what it looks like to me? It looks like a Dark Souls boss. And I think that's sure. where the ter- the terror comes for me is because I've been beaten so many times by that comical little thump on the head. Right. It, Except they're just medium. Like if this was a gargantuan, sure. Sure. But. Sure, but I don't know. I think it's it's I would imagine it like sliding across the ground, not like like literally dragging gliding is the word I'm looking for, where it like moves so quickly and you would expect its little arm hands to be kind of cumbersome. But instead, it's moving like a spider just like quickly along the ground and then just comes up and, you know, one hand out with its psychedelic orb. The other one just whacks you across. I, I don't know. It's. You, it can be comical in your head. For me, whatever reason, this thing is just invoking pure terror. I think its height has something to do with it. Like, so it's medium, but it like clearly doesn't have full legs because it has like its lizard lower half. Sure. So it's probably like just like a few feet tall. Yeah. And it has the torso <laughs> of like, like a normal just... sized person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it like they want like the art. Art in this one went like one step too far and it's just kind of pushed it over to the realm of absurd for me. That's fine. It comes off kind of comical. That's totally fine. I We can 100% agree to disagree on that. This I don't yeah. even like looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's other attack action where it could be used as part of multi-attack. A psychedelic orb. The seer hurls a glimmering orb at one creature within 120 feet that it can see. The target must succeed on a DC 19 wisdom saving throw or take 5d10 psychic damage and suffer a random condition until the start of the seer's next turn. So for the condition, you roll a d6. If it's 1 to 2, you're blinded. 3 or 4, you're frightened. 5 or 6, you're stunned. 
So it's pretty nuts. Yeah, good damage, cool condition. Overall, just a, a neat ability. Yeah, very high save. And it specifically, it's a save, not a ranged attack. So you could do this on somebody like even if there's a uh, enemy within five feet of this here, like you're not, they're not getting disadvantage or anything like that. One thing that I find weird, weird, and this is just around the senses aspect, is that if a so it has blind sight and it has tremor sense, great, out to sixty feet. I guess the game, and this is just like a wide 5th edition thing, it doesn't really specify if something just has normal vision. Because right. its range is out to 120 feet, but if you blinded it in another way, because I guess if you used blinded on it, it would then have its blind sight and tremor sense out to 60 feet, so then its psychedelic orb could only be used within 60 feet at that point. Right, hey. It does, in a sense, call out. Um, so, like this crawler says, "Blind sight, thirty feet." Parentheses, blind beyond this radius. This oh, year does right. it. So, yeah, the assumption is that unless it says something like that, that they are can see infinitely until the end of it, of time. They just keep seeing. Mm-hmm. The problem being, they ain't got no eyes. Um, that's what the crystals are. Crystal eyes. <laughs> Uh, maybe the crystal thing's okay. a mask. Maybe. It doesn't, doesn't look like it's trying to be a there. mask, though. No, it doesn't. I mean, the emissary had the same problem. Do you yeah. see eyes? No, I see just tubes. Don't make me look at the tubes again. <laughs> <laughs> Little floppy sponges that shoot out crystals. I don't like it. Yeah. All right. And then the seer has a reaction fused damage. When the seer is hit by an attack, it takes only half of the triggering damage. The first time the seer hits with they. Yeah, sorry. The first time the seer hits with a melee attack on its next turn, the target takes an extra 1d6 radiant damage. So it's kind of like absorb elements. Uh, this is reaction to use, so it's phrased in a way where it sounds like every single time they only take half damage. It's only when they choose to use this based on their reaction. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's good. It At 153 HP, challenge rating 13, I think it needs something like this for the big damage mm-hmm. when it does land. Uh, the fact that it has magic resistance is going to be its save against spells. Fuse damage is its save against, you know, paladins doing big old smites um, or rogues doing their damage. Right. And also then I think not being alone. I don't think you should ever fight the seer alone. No. This is very much... Hey, there's not a lot of flavor to go off of, but it kind of, well, if it's 22 intelligence, gets the impression it's kind of going to be in a leadership position. And so when it's finally time to fight the seer, you have the seer, two emissaries, and 15 crawlers, or, you know, something like that. And that's that's enough crawlers to physically keep people away from the seer. I like and then they stay in the back, lobbing psychedelic orbs. I like to imagine a scenario where it's, like in the actual back of an encounter and it's just sitting on a higher up area, like on a, a stone throne for whatever reason, a crystal (laughs) throne, even if we want to, you know, continue the, the crystal thing and you can't really see it's, it's legs by any mean, but it keeps like throwing down the psychedelic orbs. And then finally, after let's say the, the emissaries are killed or maybe one or two of them are killed, just it like rising up. (laughs) It just has all these weird little legs and starts crawling down the side of a wall. (laughs) Uh, that that would, again, be nightmare fuel for me. Right. Not for you. You'd just be laughing the entire time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, does it have spider climb? It doesn't. It doesn't. I was going to say that's the yeah. one thing that, that really kills it, though, is is no, no climb speed. Right. Probably just give it to it. Yeah. No one's going to question that. I wonder, like, why would Earth Glide be limited to the X axis? You know, that's a very good point, actually. So even creepier, almost, is it just stood up and then just phased through the Earth, and then just uh, oh, it's right in front of you now. Right. Yeah, I'm more like imagining like clipping up a video game hill. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it has no issues with ending its turn in Earth. I know that's often a thing. But this one does not have to worry about that. Honestly, if you were in a cave, it could just keep peeking out, lobbing psychedelic orbs, and going back into the earth. That'd be the worst thing you could do as a DM ever. But it could, in yeah, fact, yeah. do that. Yeah, that would be kind of hard to manage. Yeah, I don't know how... Yeah, you'd ha- 
how you fight that. Yeah. Like, I mean, the best you could do is stand around where it's coming out and ready your actions and someone tries to grapple it. But it, it with due to blind sense and charmer sense, it knows where you are. So, and it has 30 feet, so just like move over a little bit and then do it there. Yeah. You have to almost just hope that a hold monster works, which, again, it's got plus nine to wisdom saves and, and advantage. advantage. So, yeah. eek, that's going to take a while to, to work out. Uh, yeah. Probably how I would use that is starting combat like that and, and being a jerk for a little bit. And then having it not do that anymore because reasons because reasons because it's yeah. it's got to use its fission staff you know and it's it's time to end things as if, right. as if it does more damage than its psychedelic orbs it doesn't right no <laughs> <sighs> that's I always it's hate the that same, monster actually. design it's the same their average is the same oh twenty seven and twenty seven yeah. True. But the psychedelic orbs, I mean, so the fission staff is guaranteed prone. There's no save against it. Psychedelic orbs has a save, but then blinded, frightened, or stunned. It's, yeah, psychedelic orb is just better. I don't know if I. It's also psychic damage. Agree, only because the fission staff gets the bonus from that fuse damage, and uh, when you knock somebody prone, gives you a much higher chance of critting, and this can crit. Yeah. Psychedelic orb can't crit. Right, but I mean, if they're blinded, every attack against them has advantage. If they are stunned, every attack against them has advantage. Okay. Anyways. But still, Including ben ranged crit. attacks. It's not ranged. It's a saving throw. No, I'm just saying, though, like any... Prone is disadvantage for ranged attacks. And I... advantage for melee attacks. Blinded and stunned is just advantage that is totally right from a mechanical standpoint but in completely irrelevant in the core spawn conversation because none of them have ranged attacks all right but then, again that's it's you're, you're up, totally man. right you're totally right <laughs> no no you're right um, you're right yeah <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter if they're stunned or if they're prone whatever um i think the however they can give their themselves as well as others a chance to crit is very good and they have a lot of ways of doing that either knocking right. them prone or blinding them stunning them whatever but then once your core spawn emissary comes up and does four no sorry three of its talent attacks all at advantage and if it crits that's 40 10 plus three damage it's the it gets dangerous it gets very dangerous mm-hmm Right, and then with the seer, you were saying like halfway through the battle, like revealing itself and coming down. I think the really cool halfway through the battle thing is to summon the correspond worm, Ooh. The, the big boy, and the final stat here. I didn't think um, about that. I like it. Yeah, yeah. We needed a segue. We're really bad at those, but there was one, and I just ruined it by pointing it out. So this invertebrate horror has quivering barbed tentacles set around its massive, massive toothy maw. The worm's cracked and stony hide pulses with a dull orange glow, as it might be. Composed of primordial lava, perpetually on the verge of hardening into solid rock. Challenge rating 15, armor class of 18, 279 hit points, speed of 60 feet with a burrow speed of 40, whopping strength of 26. Uh, Dex of only 5 though, 20 constitution, 6 intelligence, 8 wisdom, 4 charisma. So crazy strength and con, crappy everything else. Uh, Does plus 10 to its con saves and a plus 4. Floor four to wisdom saves, damage vulnerabilities to cold and immunities to fire and psychic. Its condition immunities to charmed and frightened, and has a blind and tremor sense. Um, understands deep speech, but can't talk. So, it, passive abilities illumination. It sheds dim light in a twenty foot radius. Radiant mirror. If the worm takes radiant damage, each creature within twenty feet of it takes the damage as well, which is neat. But I feel like radiant damage, unless you specifically have like a paladin or a cleric, just doesn't really come up. No, but it so did come up when you guys fought it, and it made me really happy. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I could see like if this gets summoned, the paladin's going to smite it. Yeah. And then, yeah, there's no save on that. It just happens. And it would happen to everyone within 20 feet. Yeah, including this thing's allies, but yeah. I think we already determined it doesn't care. Nobody... <laughs> Not right. nobody cares. None of the core spawn care. 
Right. But that'd be fun to watch. Basically yeah. setting off a, a Radiant AoE. The only thing that I didn't like about Radiant Mirror is I feel like I didn't understand the the physical attributes of what is happening. You hit it with Radiant Damage and then what? It explodes in Radiant Light itself? And I remember yeah. stumbling on that when you guys were fighting it. I was just like, oh shit, what, what, is, what is happening right now? Yeah, that's how I would take it. It kind of like the energy like reverberates within its core and then bursts back out. Yeah. Either way, and also cool ability. Yeah, f- I mean, I've I've never seen that before. That's so yeah. I like that. Yeah. And then the tunneler feature: the worm could burrow through solid rock at half its burrowing speed and leaves a ten foot diameter tunnel in its wake. So, most like per, I think purple worms have that. Yeah. It's common for like these big worm <clears> enemies. <throat> Um, the rest of the stat block, honestly, it's really similar to any, like, gargantuan, just kind of tanky thing, purple worms, and that's why it keeps coming back to, but I know there's more that are like it, but blanking. Anyways, uh, it has a multi-attack, it makes two attacks, one with its barbed tentacles and one with its bite barbed tentacles, attack of plus 13 to hit, reach of 10 feet, does 5d6 plus 8 piercing damage, which is an average of 25, so a heavy hit, and the target is grappled, the escape DC is 18, so pretty high, until the grapple ends, the target is restrained, so really awful. The tentacles can grapple only one creature at a time. So that's pretty pretty crappy thing to get hit by there's no save to not be grappled and restrained you can do it after the fact but then you're having it does restraint give you disadvantage on that stuff it does not no so you would not have disadvantage to get out but it's still dc 18 yeah that's pretty high that grapple yeah and then if you're restrained all of your attacks have disadvantage and every attack on you has advantage restraint sucks yeah and uh i'm sure you wouldn't want the follow-up to have advantage on right. you either because it's not done. That was its first attack. Oh, right. So it gets you in its tentacles and holds you up and you restrain. And so its future attacks will have advantage when it bites you of plus 13 to hit. Uh, reach of 10 feet. 5d8 plus 8 piercing damage. So an average of 30. And if the target is large or smaller, it must succeed on a DC 18 dex saving throw or be swallowed by the worm, which I'm pretty sure it would you have do. disadvantage on. Yeah, you do have disadvantage on dex saves when yeah. you are restrained. Yeah, and DC 18 is pretty tough. A swallowed creature is blinded and restrained, has total cover against attacks and other effects outside the worm, and takes 6d6, an average of 21, fire damage at the start of each of the worm's turns. Um, so, I mean, that's terrible, that's devastating, but it is pretty standard swallow condition stuff. Sure. These combo well off each other with the barbed tentacles to restrain, then a bite. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I think I still remember the, the one time I tried actually doing the swallow, the... I think it was the fighter like actually succeeded on the dc 18 saving throw even at disadvantage or whatever yeah so it's it's always possible um i think i did end up getting somebody swallowed for at least a turn or him. two yeah it was our fighter it was yeah um, he survived yes he did i think he ended up riding the worm down the hole like down the the tunnel that it, it burrowed which was just cool just yeah. a cool moment <laughs> right <laughs> all right um continuing when you're swallowed though again pretty pretty typical stuff here but we'll read through it if the worm takes 30 damage or more on a single turn from a creature inside it the worm must succeed on a dc 21 constitution saving throw at the end of that turn or regurgitate all swallowed creatures which fall prone with in a space within 10 feet of the worm if the worm dies the creature is no longer restrained and it can escape by using 20 feet of movement exiting prone yep so as you said pretty standard stuff there um it when we had it it was definitely a well i thought it was a fun fight um Mm -hmm. but it's it's nothing too crazy beyond that radiant mirror and i think you guys did also figure out that it was vulnerable to cold damage and yeah i just always love that when cold when vulnerabilities actually play into uh the strategy yeah for sure um i think this is the type of creature that could have benefited really well from like a passive ability, if you hit it with a melee attack within five feet, you then take 1d6 or 2d6 the fire damage. Remoraz abilities? Yeah, like heat bursts out of it. That's totally fair. I also see why they didn't do that, just because I I think this has a lot on the stat block. I won't say a lot going on for it, but there's just a lot on here already, and I'm sure, well, maybe they didn't think about it at all. 
I'm I, I don't know what these people don't are know. thinking. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> its damage is very high. Yeah. On average, it could dish out fifty five damage in a turn. And if swallow and restrain yeah, you. Th- yeah, if it's swallowed, then what, 70, 76 damage in a turn? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty yeah. pretty heavy hitting. Oh, yeah. I really do like the idea, though, of you saying the correspond seer summoning this, this worm. Oh, yeah. my God, what an awesome visual. Right. Yeah, right as you think, you're, you're kind of like... You know, most encounters seem to have that like kind of arc where it's like you're sort of fighting uphill and you sort of get to the point where you realize you're about to cusp that hill and then it's just a matter of finishing the battle and then this thing pops up. Yeah. This, I mean, overall, this, these monsters together would just be a, a terrifying but fantastic fight. I can't think of a reason why you would fight them, though. That's actually what I'm struggling with, is like a way to introduce them into your game that's actually a plot hook and not just a, hey, fight these things because I said so. Uh, terrorizing an area. Sure. Like specifically, like if you're in the Underdark, I can that's see some good. of the friendly or Underdark creatures asking for help. And I could... Or kind of like a Locust thing from Gears of War, the coarse bond worm creates these tunnels from which the rest flow. That's a kind of situation That's I could see happening. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, and I could see somebody in some way controlling them, a, a chaos entity of any type, um, giving them their direction. It would need to be a very powerful chaos entity, but that's kind of my point here of if you wanted it to be a larger overarching enemy that comes up multiple times, you can do that. You've got some variety here. I think there's a lot of encounter variety in in how uh, they are I guess, engaged with. Because uh, it would start off, you know, you're seeing a lot of just the crawlers and maybe you fight a crawler and one time you see an emissary and you're like, whoa, what is this thing? And it's a tough fight. And then you get to the point you're fighting three of them. And then final fight, as you kind of mentioned, a correspond seer summoning a worm would just be the like, whoa like this is the peak obviously this is the boss fight right you could even have a few fights with the seer beforehand where the party isn't intended to finish it off it has a lot of ways to escape so yeah that's always scary though what do you mean i feel like anytime like someone has one of those plans inevitably then there's like a post on our dnd next or on twitter about like yeah, so my party managed to kill the big bad evil guy way, way before they were supposed to. What do I do now? <laughs> uh, that's fair, but in that case, I would make a stronger correspond seer. Just boost up something for it and and throw <laughs> the correspond seer twin brother. No, I mean that's not correspond seer too. Yeah, and they're not a single entity by any means. I, no, I know. Um, but I'd make it taller. <laughs> just be like stacked on top of each other basically. it's the lizard legs man it's just, they just needed like regular bipedal movement and that's still long tattered robes of crystals sticking out and make it like 6-5 and it's still be creepy as fuck isn't that basically just make a, it huge a death lock would 6-5 make lock? it huge it's, no 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 six, five, I said huge. make it huge oh like it's what it is but huge yeah okay yeah that's fine no I think you're right just making it bigger and that's it's a way to um just to play around that oh no my party killed it when they weren't supposed to it's like okay well here's one that's now immune to being um killed paralyzed <laughs> not killed yeah it's just you just can't yeah. kill it no but <laughs> the only way you're going to kill this thing and you don't want it to be killed or you want it to to be able to leave is if the party somehow manages to cast hold monster on it and the next one, you just say, no, you can't do that. It literally doesn't work. <laughs> right. And and in that case, it needs to be protecting something. That's why it would be a final confrontation is it has a goal that it needs to carry out and death or failure isn't an option. I don't right. know what that scenario is. Obviously, it's it's something, but. Uh, course bomb worm hatchery. Okay, sure, sure. And so you go kill all the eggs. Right, and so it summons the mother to protect it. Right. And that's that's the party's goal, is to uh, clear out the core spawn worm. Uh, yeah, eggs. That's perfect. Because yeah. if those all hatch and get to full strength, it will 
literally destroy the world. I mean, that could, just the amount of, of burrowing and tunneling, whatever. <laughs> this tiny comb the earth. They don't directly attack anything. They spend decades just burrowing out the crust of the earth. This is and the then plot eventually of it all just collapses. This is the plot of Gears of War. Was it? Yes. They literally... I, I played those games. I don't remember the intricacies of the plot. Was that like the goal of like, I, the locusts? Kind of. Their goal ended up being to outrun like a virus lampancy. But their whole thing was when they were attacking cities, a lot of times, yes, they would have their emergence holes. They'd pop out, cause some chaos, whatever, and bounce. But they did in Gears of War 2 get these tunneler worms that would literally be like giant freaking things you go into one in gears of war 2 yeah, like that. yeah yeah and it would go circle around a city until it dropped the city out that's awesome yeah so yeah you're like saying it kind of dismissively but no that's awesome like that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the plot of it um so yeah these these do actually work very well i think there's a good uh, connection there will of, of saying they're like the locusts they're very much like the locusts so any scenarios in Gears of War, just use those. And make sure just all of your player characters make get the entire plot Gears of War. That's my new answer to that former question. <laughs> From our episode. What, what yeah. other universe should we combine with the indie? Gears of War. What's the change? I mean, everybody, yeah. everybody gets size 15 boots. Yep. <laughs> Huge hands, big meaty, meaty hands, chainsaw and, rifles in the fantasy universe. Like three foot around necks. Just the yeah. thickest necks. <laughs> yeah, that's that's gonna be the only class added is thick necks. Thick ne- <laughs> <laughs> you got thick necks and thin necks. What I always loved, I, I really did enjoy the Gears series. I like actually read the books. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. But uh, the Marines or whatever they're the Cogs were so much bigger. And then you would see a civilian, and you'd realize like, oh, that's not everybody in the universe. That's literally just the 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 soldiers and such. There are normal sized people in this world. Yeah. They stole it all. They stole it from Warhammer, but did yeah. it in a way that wasn't completely silly. Right. How tall is a Marine? 15 feet. Give or take. <laughs> <laughs> How big are their biceps? You don't even want to know. You don't even want to know. <laughs> all right. Anything else around the course bonds? No. Okay. Oh, they're fun. They're fun, they're scary, or they're silly, depending on on your mood. <laughs> Just the seer. Yeah. Yeah, if if somebody says that the emissary is not scary, they're they're just wrong. That is that is horrifying. Mhm. Weird little proboscis. Or how do you pronounce that? Yeah. I feel like I pronounced that wrong. Proboscis. Proboscis. Yes. Yeah. That was in You're an close. earlier episode as well. Look at that. We're repeating ourselves. Hundred Episode 101. And we're having the same conversations again. Good. And a conversation that you have definitely heard before is our conversation around our affiliates, Metallic Dice Games, uh, where you can get 10% off your order using the code MM10. And you can order some dice, metal dice, crystal dice. You can... Put them in your little honeycomb tubes and shoot them at your friends. And, uh, yeah, you can do that. So order some crystal dice from Metallic Dice Games. honeycomb tubes we all secretly have beneath our forehead flap. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're so funny, Kevin. Shut the fuck up. Don't (laughs) tell people about those flaps. (laughs) I thought the forehead flap was most humans. No. Oh, shit. (laughs) Anyways, check out Metallic Dice Games, and if you want to support us in other ways, head on over to monstersandmulticlass.com forward slash support, where you can find our other affiliates like Describe and um, Bardley and the Crafty Gamer. Yeah, I got them all. That was easy, easy recollection. And thank you to all of our patron subscribers. You're all awesome. And I, yeah, I don't have the list in front of me, so do the thing. <laughs> really put the pressure on you to make that thank you <laughs> yeah it'll be like a minute of work i know fine. i believe it yeah <laughs> cool all right as always thanks for watching